Well, good morning and welcome to episode 31 of Radiant Reflections. Pastor Josh Harriman here, joined today by a very special guest, <laughs> Pastor Josh Brown. How are you doing this morning? Man, I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here. Radiant Reflections is one of my favorite podcasts. This is, you know what, I, I maybe it's kind of like self-centered, but I listen to it. Yeah. Like I listen, no, I mean, I listen to it, Trev, like, hey, like, did we communicate what we wanted to communicate? Yeah. With more of that, like, yep. assessment kind of lens. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, I actually enjoy listening yep. to our own podcast. I don't know if that's self-centered or not, but. No, I think it's good. I mean, definitely for quality control, but to burrow in kind of, you know, what was talked about on, on Sundays, it's good. Yeah, it's good. So this yeah. past Sunday here at Radio Life, we kicked off a new series called Reset. Uh, you know, coming off just the chaos that has been COVID-19, mm-hmm. uh, Pastor Ryan really felt like uh, we needed to reset some things in our lives to to reset some of the aspects of our walk with Christ. So this past Sunday, JB, we talk, and those for those of you that are listening and you're not familiar with the Radiant Life, uh, we refer to Pastor Josh Brown as JB. Uh, I obviously both of us have the name Joshua, and I was second. <laughs> and, I came and, and, a few months and I got after here Josh. First, so, <laughs> so we made him have a nickname. Um, I have been called JB most of my life by other people too. So it's it's so not it weird. works. Yeah, it's fun. it works. Yeah. But uh, you know, for those of you that don't know, JB is our worship pastor. And the thing that Pastor Ryan talked about this past week to reset is our worship. Yeah. So first of all, and this is this is actually off script, okay, JB, but like. That title, worship pastor. Yeah. What does that mean? I mean, I mean, I mean, there, yeah. there, there, there are probably people listening yes. that think, well, that just means that you, you sing, like right. you, you're a musician, so you're the right. worship pastor. Right. Like, what is unpack just briefly? Sure. What that actually means and what your role is, mm-hmm. because you're not just a musician. Right. You're not just a worship. Like you are a, a pastor. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think it varies from church to church on what a worship leader or a worship pastor is. But yeah, uh, for me here at Radiant Life, it is um, organization. You know, we use a, we use a um, a piece of software called Planning Center, and it pulls in different musicians at different times. It's prayerfully working with you and Ryan on what songs we're going to introduce to the congregation. Why? Um, it's prayerfully talking through structure of services. Why or why would we, why or why not would we do certain things? Um, but yeah, I, you know, as a pastor, we, we talked about this before, that means shepherd. Right. Um, I think one of, one of my most important roles, at least to me, is shepherding the 40 plus uh, members of the worship ministry here at Radiant Life, just talking with them, praying with them, getting to know them. Um, and then uh, just overall, as a pastor at the church, I get to pray and talk with people uh, on not a, even about music necessarily. It can be about anything. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, and we've we've talked about worship here in some of the earlier episodes mm-hmm. of the podcast, but just especially for those that haven't, uh, maybe they're just jumping in now. And episode thirty-one is the first one that they've right. heard. Right. Uh, what is worship? Right. You know. It's a big question, you know, and it's something I've <laughs> pondered. Uh, I've been a worship leader and, and pastor for almost 20 years, and it's, it's a question that I ask often. Um, if you look in the scriptures, we know in the New Testament we get our, our New Testament from the Greek and the Aramaic, and if you go back to the Greek language, uh, the word worship most of the time is the word proskuneo, the Greek word proskuneo, which is where we get our uh, English word prostrate, Mm. Um, and it specifically means to fawn over or to crouch or to prostrate oneself in homage to something. Um, so I think, you know, for me, a, a working definition, um, worship is ascribing a greater value mm. to something. And, and I think that when, when we worship God, that's, that's actually what we're saying. You know, you're greater than everything. And in these moments, I'm admitting that, um, it's ascribing worth, worthship. You know, that's there's there's some of that in there as well. So that that's kind of my my working definition. No, that's good. And it actually, so it you know when you talk about that, you know, this idea of of fawning over. Yeah. Uh, it it actually like my brain goes to how easily it is to fall into idolatry, mm. and you look at some of the things that we as as yeah. humanity that we 
fawn over yeah. that we you know, we worship. ascribe great worth to. Yes, uh, you know, and and we might not think of that as oh, well, I don't, yeah. I don't worship this thing. I don't worship yeah. this celebrity or this right. activity. Right. But if we really dig deep. That's exactly what we're well, doing. <laughs> and, and, you know, the Radiant Reflections is meant to be an unpacking of the Sunday message. And I felt like Ryan, I mean, he said worship takes place at football games. Mm. He said to us, if you, if, you, if you guys go back and you listen, he said, you know how to worship because you do this every time a touchdown is scored or whatever it might be. And um, I, I like that kind of preaching. <laughs> Personally, I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was a good poke because it's real. Mm. That is genuine. That was a genuine exhortation. I think to worship, you know, it's also sacrifice, right? Um, and we see that example uh, all through the first covenant. There were various offerings and prescribed sacrifices, certain things. They had to look a certain way. They had to be the very best. Mm. Um, they had to happen at certain times of the day, uh, sometimes certain holy times during the year, um, you know, that's a big part of worship is sacrificing. And Ryan touched on that this Sunday as well. Really encouraged by last Sunday's message. If you haven't watched it or listened to it, uh, go check it out. It's, it's at the radiant life church forward slash. Is it media? Yes. Yeah, slash yeah, media slash media. If you want to listen, um, or you can watch it on the church Facebook page or YouTube channel. Uh, it was a great, it was a great message. And I want to say too, cause there might be, and, and I, and I know that there can be people like this because uh, for a lot of my life, I've been this type of person. <laughs> but for those of you that are listening saying, ha, he said that was part of first covenant worship. Ha, ah, we don't have to, we don't have to, ah, Romans 12, right? Right. Living sacrifices. It seats you therefore. Like, I mean, this, yes. is, this is not something that is, oh, yeah. like we're, we're done with that. There's yeah. no element of sacrifice anymore in worship. Right. That is absolutely not true. Sacrifices, that we're called to be living yeah. sacrifices. I think it got harder. It, the the it sacrifice did. is greater. It did. Yeah. Ra rather mm -hmm. than, hey, you know, yeah. eight times a year I've got to go and I've got to bring a pigeon or a lamb. Yes. Like this is a constant day-to-day yes. -day sacrifice mm -hmm. uh, of worship. Yeah. David kind of gave us a glimpse of that, even though he was a first covenant king and, and psalmist and leader. He said, you know, I'm never going to give anything to God that isn't of value. Mm. He, had, he understood that this sacrifice was, it's not the bottom rung. It's the top shelf. It's not the last. It's the first. Um, I'll, while you're talking, I'm going to look for the scripture. There's one in, in Peter that talks about worship being uh, part of our sacrifice. Mm. And I can't remember where that's at. I think that's it's good. First Peter 4, but at any rate. But yeah, but it's, I mean, but it's this all-encompassing thing. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I mean it's, it's ascribing a, a greater place to God than, than us in everything, whether that's, uh, you know, the way we spend our time the way we spend our money, mm -hmm. the way we, you know, all of these things yes. fall under, uh, in a sense, the jurisdiction of worship. Yeah. You know, none of the, none of these are areas where you can say, nope, you know what? God isn't greater um, in this area. Right. It's, it's a, it's an all, all in type of, uh, and I've, I've used this quote, I believe before on the podcast, I'll use it again. I believe this is a quote that's attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, German pastor, theologian. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually uh, killed for being part of a, a assassination attempt on Hitler yep. uh, during during uh, that era. Uh, but he says, if, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, Jesus isn't Lord at all. You know, this idea that we can't pick and choose where we want to uh, relinquish our greatness to the greatness of God. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, that's, that's step one of salvation. If you think about it, you're initially saying that there's a God in heaven, there's a creator that I'm accountable to. And that first act of worship is identifying him for who he is mm -hmm. for saying that, you know, that he's Lord, he's King, he's master. And I will bend my knee. I'll crouch. I'll fawn in this moment. And, and I think, you know, it's like the rest of life. It's, it's a, um, it's a better and greater understanding of what worship is. That's all it is. Because that's what we were made for. Mm. You know, we were created to do this. Oh, that's good. So let's talk about music. Yeah. Because, you know, why do you think people so readily associate worship with yeah. music? You know, you talk, you know, we go have a, a worship night. Yeah. And people think, oh, well, we're going to sing. Right. 
You know, right. what, what is that? Uh, how is that yeah. a right connection? Mm-hmm. And how might worship be more broad than just music? Right. Well, your my answer might surprise you, being oh. a, a worship arts pastor. Um, I think the reason first that people associate music with worship is because of the emotions connected with music. Uh, dig it, dig into that a little. Yeah. Bit. So, um, okay, let's talk teenage angst, right? You probably remember the days. For me, it was the the early and mid '90s in high school. Some, some Nirvana blasting. Some okay. Kurt Cobain. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. For me, it was Nine Inch Nails. Right. Okay. Right. The first. The Trent, first. Trent Reznor. Trent Reznor. Yeah. Really dark individual. Really dark individual. And in the midst of that, you know, changing that happens in in high school and junior high up to high school, you listen to that kind of music, and there are feelings that happen. There, there's there's emotions, and that happens with music. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad music. Mm. Um, so I think the reason that people um, immediately connect music, the church has taught it. The church has has left that impression. I think over the years, we we've disconnected other forms of worship. But I think it has a lot to do with how we feel when we worship. We feel good, and because we feel good when we sing or we hear music that we enjoy, um, we we associate that with that being the only form of worship. So mm. I think that's a bad thing uh, in a sense. It's a good thing also because the scriptures tell us plainly. I mean, it's filled. And Ryan, again, uh, this last Sunday did a great job of unpacking a lot of psalms that talk specifically about guitars and drums and cymbals and dancing and raising hands and clapping and bowing. Like the word of God is full of physical examples of music and worship being connected, definitely. But it isn't the only worship, and I think that that's that's what you're hinting at. Right. And for those of you that are like, wait a minute, they didn't have guitars in the Bible. We're talking cultural equivalents. Calm down. (laughs) Yes. Yes. They didn't have drums. Yes, they did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They definitely had, you know, shapes of metal that were cymbals that were pounded flat and made sound. Yeah, there were harps, lutes, lyres. Um, There's... um, even in some of the Psalms, some people don't know this, but there's this little pretext at the beginning of chapters. Uh, you, you might think that that's something that the translators entered into the Psalm to help you understand what it's about. It's actually part of the Holy Word of God. And some of these Psalms will say, to the tune of, and they name the song. Or they'll say the instrument that is supposed to be played as you read this song. Or it'll say, this is the time of year, a Psalm for the Sabbath, a Psalm for this day. That is actually part of God's word. So it's, it's basically an instruction uh, on what that psalm is about, even the song that's contained therein. Mm. And then, you know, some psalms, they've got that little, little thing that puzzles everybody. Yes. Right? Where it says, Selah. Yes. <laughs> Selah. That's right. <laughs> so, that just means pause. That's right. Meditate. Wait. In, in, the, in the worship team world, Josh and I, we call that a vamp. And not vampires, but we are literally just... Like uh, chilling and letting the music float for people, no really, singing. Yeah, like a, like a musical interlude, a meditative type of time. thing. Yeah, I mean, hey, mm-hmm. let's we just sang these these lyrics. Uh, let's take a second and digest <laughs> the things space that to we process. Just, yeah, the things yeah. that we just said and sang. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, that's good. Yeah, uh, but I mean, yeah. So you, and Ryan did get on this a little bit in the message, but I mean, so so music is part of worship but not yeah. all like what else would you yeah. want to put out there like oh well hey like this is an aspect of worship this mm-hmm. is an aspect of worship you know yeah what are some of those things it, you know there's a couple of things that Jesus talked about more than anything else one of the number one things that Jesus talked about was hell mm. that's hard to hard to believe but uh, one of the number two things that Jesus talked about was money and finances, and it's been said by lead- leaders for centuries. If you want to see what a person worships, look at their checkbook. Mm-hmm. So I think that money is a great way for us to to um, worship. So I can choose to say uh, I'm greater than God if we're using that that kind of idea of, of a definition of worship, and keep all that God has given me for myself and for my own gain. Or I can ascribe a greater value to God and to the things of God and give towards those things. So mm-hmm. and here's another thing for me. This is just morning ritual, right? About a year ago, um, my wife, if she's, I don't think she watches these or listens. Maybe she does. <laughs> Come on, Lisa. Yeah, right? Come on, Lisa. <laughs> 
Uh, she likes crime podcasts. Her and crime? Ian. Yeah, like, like you know, like, like um, cops and robbers. Yeah, crime? well, no, like like like, um, the, uh, like a Who Done It Dateline style podcast. Her and Ian oh. got into these podcasts. They love them. Anyway, we derailed there. I'm sorry. Uh, about a year ago, the, the Lord started showing me, you know, I, I come to work, I do the things that I do, I provide for my family, but I wasn't really doing much in terms of like the daily flow of what happens at a house. There's so much. Uh, and so God just began to challenge me and say that I needed to, to sacrifice in the morning first. And the sacrifice that I needed to offer was giving my time and myself, not my money, because I could take my wife out and buy her whatever, you know. You could do those things, and that's mm -hmm. easy to do. That's an easy thing to do. Uh, but God was saying, okay, when you get up, you need to take care of the dogs. It sounds silly, but this is what the Lord told me. You, you need to take care of the dogs. You need to make coffee for your wife. You need to feed the dogs. You need to empty or, or load the dishwasher. You need to clean out the coffee machine and get it ready for the next day. And he told me to do this before I do anything else, even before I start reading my Bible. Hmm. To do these acts of service first. And I hated it. Oh my gosh. The first like <laughs> few weeks that I was doing this, I was like, Lord, this stinks. I just want to sit down with my coffee and my Bible and read. I don't want to do this stuff. I can't hardly walk until I have my coffee. And the Lord just continued to show me this is what I need to do. And it's become part of my normal routine. Hmm. And for me, it, it, it's, it is an act of worship. It's saying, God, I hear your voice. You've commanded me to do this. It's a blessing to my wife and my family. Uh, it requires something small of me, but it's part of my process. Mm. It's part of a morning sacrifice, so to speak, a morning mm -hmm. offering for me. Um, and so that's a small way. I think serving is a huge part, apart from money, right? So uh, I think about the greatest act of worship that we can see in all of history in all of the Bible, it happened in, in the, the gospel of Matthew chapter 26. It's also in, in Mark and Luke. Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and he's facing uh, what he's been telling the disciples for, for years now. I'm going to be go, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem. I'm, I'm gonna be crucified. And he has this prayer time, this time with God, his father. And he says, God, if there's any other way uh, for what you want to happen, if there's any other way for this to happen, can you do it that way? But the greatest moment of worship in all of history is these words, nevertheless, not my will, mm. but your will be done, God. So Jesus submitted to the point of even giving of his own life. But that started at a moment of saying, hey, not my will, but your will. And so that sacrifice, and then, of course, we know the actual sacrifice took place just days later from the Garden of Gethsemane. But I think serving you know, does that mean at a soup kitchen in your town? Does it mean like you do, Josh, you play bass guitar, you're talented and skilled in that. You give on Thursdays, mm. you give time away from family throughout the week, you practice. Sunday mornings you come and you serve two weeks. Josh isn't paid to do that. Which I want to actually, I want to pause because I want to, yeah. I don't know if people recognize the amount of uh, time and energy that the, the people on our music team and oh, the, the tech team, uh, they pour in every week they do. so that we can do, you know, we love all of our change makers, mm -hmm. uh, but probably like Hours. more than most, uh, yeah. our, our musicians and our tech team devote the most hours per week. Uh, and like JB said, they're not getting paid for it. This is right. something that they do as a as an act of service. And mm -hmm. I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone uh, yeah. on that team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think finances and service are two other ways that we can think about worshiping God. Where do I give? What do I do with my money? And what do I do with my time? You know, how do I give my time and my money to the Lord? Uh, and those are acts of worship apart from music. Oh, yeah. oh that's good. That's good. So sometimes in, in church world, and, you know, and we've, we've used this language here at Radiant Life sometimes, right? You'll hear this term, posture mm -hmm. of worship. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Let, talk a little bit about some of the different, and I know Ryan got into this yeah. with some of the passages that he went through on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, but let's dig a little bit deeper into this whole idea of postures of worship and and what those look like, and why we might utilize some of those postures. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I do. Again, I want to tell you, if you haven't watched or listened to the, the message, Ryan went through a lot of scriptures 
that specifically identified postures of worship. And what do we mean by that? We mean, uh, it can mean physical positions and outward expressions that communicate what you're doing, which is worship. They can also be postures of the heart, right? Um, but the postures of worship that we see in the scriptures are dancing, right? Uh, we see bowing down or kneeling down, prostrate. That's right in the definition of worship. We see clapping, which is, is it, you know, giving accolades or applause to something. Uh, we see the raising of hands, mm. right? Uh, which Ryan unpacked really well by saying, you know, it's this act of, of rejoicing and submission. It's twofold. It's saying, there's nobody greater but you. You're awesome, right? Like we would, we did at a, at a sporting event or I am open-handed saying, Father, like a, like a small child would look up to their father, arms up, pick me up. There's an act of submission declaring who God is. So, um, yeah, the postures are really important. Mm. They really are. Um, and again, it's that uh, ascribing of a greater value. It's doing something that others might think or seem to be odd. And one of the greatest examples of that we see with David and his wife, Michael, right? When David uh, came back from battle in the scriptures, it says that he put on a linen ephod. And this is, I don't think it might be in Samuel. I'm not sure. And he danced with all of his might before the Lord. Now his wife, Michael was up in their house and she's looking out the window and she sees David doing this, this posture of worship. David comes in, he's probably, you know, like sweaty and like he just, it was like a <laughs> nasty. Soup. Yeah. Like he was getting <laughs> after it. Right. And Michael says, how foolish did the King look today among his servants? Mm. How foolishly he acted. David said, I will act even more. He rebuked her. He, he, he kind of put her in her place and said, I will be even more foolish before the Lord. This is nothing he's basically saying. Um, so there are these postures of worship that are foreign and unknown and, and difficult for us to, um, to understand. Uh, here's a basic way I, I like to look at it. You think about this. Now, I'm not going to get political here, but imagine if the president of the United States walks into the room. Okay, it can be Obama or it can be Trump in this What's or it? Biden or Trump right pick, now. I mean, basically you pick, pick, it. pick, pick yes. the one that you like. You put this in your head. <laughs> We're not going to tell you which one. But would I just go up and be like, what's up, President Trump? Nope. I'd get shot. <laughs> right. I'm coming at him. I'm going to get shot if I try to give him a high five. Right. Uh, no, I am going to approach in a very certain way to something that I'm ascribing greater value to. It isn't regular. It isn't normal. I mean, how often do we bow before our boss at work? Right. We don't do this. Or do we say, yes, I'll go make those 10 copies that you asked me to make, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't do that. It, it, the postures of worship, they're also a way to communicate the greaterness mm. of the object that we are posturing ourselves before. So they communicate an, an inward thing that's happened in our heart outward. So people know, man, when this person's got their hand up, oh, what's going on there? Oh, now I know. Ooh, okay. So I want to chase this down a little bit. And yep. I haven't fully fleshed this, this idea out. So, yep. so bear with me. Um, this might be like a chicken or egg type of scenario. Okay. And I'll say, and this was actually one of my next questions. It kind of dealt with like the nonverbals. Yeah. Right, the nonverbals of worship. Right. Do we, does our heart have to be there first? And, and the posture is always a reflection of something in the heart, or can the, the change in posture be the cause? Uh, did, I these do. Are going, yeah. and, and I'll say this because I'll, I'll give, I'll give uh, a a, a personal example, All right? I've had times, well, you, we were at 41 hours together mm -hmm. this past, you know, this past February. Yeah. Uh, for those that are listening and watching, 41 hours is a... a 41 hour period of time? It's a 41 hour period of time <laughs> uh, put on by our region yeah. for pastors. Uh, they yeah. call it a retreat. And there's an, there's an aspect of that. Yeah. But I mean, it's also like we're sitting under, like, I mean, it's a lot of sessions of teaching. We're learning uh, like leadership, yep. uh, just different things like that. Um, and, and at the end of one of those nights, you know, like, they, they just had a prayer of, hey, like, who needs Holy Spirit to, like, mm. do something? And 
And I was like, I knew that I was supposed to go, and I eventually did. Right. But even when I was down there, and there was a, there was a guy praying for me, mm-hmm. but like I knew, like I was, I wanted to have what Holy Spirit had, but I didn't. Yeah. Like, and I was like, like my nonverbals, my posture, like right. my, my actual physical position, everything was very closed off. Yeah. And it wasn't until I, like I had this moment of, like you're saying you want to receive, but how are you going to receive with these closed, mm-hmm. clenched fists, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to where, I mean, like I physically had to say, okay, you know, and, and open yeah. up my hands and say, what, what do you want to, what do you want to do here? Yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but it, like, is it, it does. No, it totally does. I, I think Jesus addresses this. I think it's in John chapter four with the woman at the well, right? So this woman at the well uh, is talking about where the Jews worship. They worship over here. And Jesus said something amazing. He says, the father is searching and seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth, Right. So there's this balance of the Holy Spirit and this emotional sort of connection to God and the truth of God's word. So chicken and egg kind of thinking, I think it goes both ways, Josh. Mm. I think it's like there are times when the heart, the Holy Spirit is doing such a work in your heart that the postures are, you know. It just flows out. It just, it's organic, right? Then there are other times like where the word of God has been sown into your heart, the truth, we'll say, because we're still talking spirit and truth. The word of God has been sown into your heart and you're sitting there and you're like just feeling, feeling like you're, you're glued to the chair. And the Holy Spirit then just brings to your mind a, a, a scripture where, where God says, you know, I raise my hands and, mm. and, and worship. You then actively, consciously choose to obey that revelation in the moment, and then the hands go up. So I, I see spirit and truth worship as a circle mm. with arrows that are like the recycle circle, if you oh, think yeah. about it. Oh, I really good. do think that because it, it, it really depends on, on the circumstance. Mm. That's good. That's good. No, no cookie cutter. I like that. No. <laughs> no. I, li- I like that. I like yeah. that. So would you say that there are right or proper ways that we can worship? And are there wrong <laughs> or improper ways yeah. <laughs> that we can worship? If yeah. so, how do we, I mean, how do we wade through right. what is right and what is wrong? Like yeah. how much of, of what is right or wrong is determined by culture, preference. context, tradition, mm-hmm. uh, preference? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. How do we navigate yeah. all of that? I think that's a really tough question, but in short, I would say, yes, there are definitely wrong ways to worship. Mm. Okay. Um, the word of God is definitely our guide. If you go back into Leviticus chapter 10, for, uh, for instance, there's these two guys, Nadab and Abihu. Sons uh, of Aaron. Yeah. Sons of um, the, they, Samuel, wasn't it? Not in Leviticus, no. But Leviticus, I mean, that's... You're right, you're right. That's, yeah, the sons of Aaron. The, yeah, sons yeah. of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they're Levites. That's right. And they come into uh, the temple to do the prescribed form of worship. And in Leviticus 10, it says that they offered strange or profane fire. And in the original definition, when you look at that strange or profane, it, it, it has an adulterous connotation. Mm-hmm. Um, So we don't know, no one knows what Nadab and Abihu offered there, but God struck them dead, Mm -hmm. okay? When David and some of his uh, um, people were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back from being captured by um, uh, enemies of God, uh, God gave David specific instructions on how to bring that Ark back. They tripped as they're walking down this path. They've got the Ark of the Covenant. For those of you who don't know, the Ark is where the very holy presence of God was. The tablets of, of Moses were there. Ron's, uh, uh, Aaron's, bu- Aaron's rod that budded. These things were present. The jar of manna. Yeah, the jar of manna. There's these, these markers, these memorial stones. And they slip as they're walking. And one of the guys that is carrying the ark reaches out to grab and steady the ark of the covenant. And he is struck dead. Okay. Which as a kid, I remember reading this like, whoa. Man, he was just, I, he just, was trying, just to trying to help. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. There's a lot in the Hebrew language we don't know. Okay, so those are first covenant things. Hear us say, if you worship in a, a wrong way, God is probably not going to strike you dead. Uh, definitely, 
not going to happen. For, for your sake, we hope yes. not. Yes. For our sake, yes. we hope not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but we also know, uh, like in 1 Samuel 13, Saul, King Saul, the, the anointed king of Israel at that time, he goes and, and God is, by the prophet Samuel, has given Saul instruction, you're supposed to do this, 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 and this. And by the way, it was killing some enemies of God. And Samuel, or Saul decided, now we'll keep some of those things. We'll keep the good things. We'll keep the good stuff. That's right. Whoa. And Saul comes and is like, what did you do? Samuel know, or Saul knows he did something wrong. And Saul, who's not a Levite, he's not a son of Aaron, not a Nadab or an Abihu, he goes into the temple, not of the tribe of Levi, can't do this, and he offers a sacrifice to cover up and make up. And basically, it was a works of righteousness kind of thing. And, and Samuel comes back to Saul and says, I know what you did. The bleeding of the sheep are in my ear, Saul. God commanded you to kill my enemy, his enemies, and you didn't do it. And then you thought you could just go into the temple and perform this act of worship. The kingdom has been taken to you and given to another. This is when the kingdom of Israel was transferred to David. Mm. So we know that there are definitely ways that, that, that uh, I mean, for Saul, it cost him the throne. Um, we know that Paul, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Second Covenant, Paul wrote two letters to a church in Corinth. The Corinthians were known as people who are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty wild, boisterous, yeah, right. wild people. <laughs> like they, they had a dude who was having <clears throat> sex with his stepmom, and they were cool with it. And Paul had to tell them, mm, no, that's that. No, you, we, do, we don't do that here. Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't do that at all. <laughs> and you all shouldn't be celebrating that. You need to tell that guy to repent or cast him out of the church for an act like that. The whole book of Corinthians speaks of these ways that the Corinthians were worshiping. And Paul had to course correct them. Uh, and some of those things we're talking about prophecy. How does prophecy work within, mm -hmm. uh, the, which is a form of worship? How does a word of knowledge, how do healings, how does the gift of speaking in tongues and trans, uh, uh, um, how does that work in, oh. the, in the scriptures? So there definitely are wrong and right ways to worship. There really are. Uh, and we, we're, it's so awesome because we have God's word. We can always turn to God's word um, to find out what we should and shouldn't do in all areas, in all aspects of life, not just worship. Mm. Well, and it's interesting, and I don't know that this would qualify as worship. We'll see, just as we're talking, you know, and with like, you know, the sons of Aaron and, and the penalty for yeah. their, their false worship. But you also read, I believe it's in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira. I thought of that scripture this <laughs> right? morning, Right, you, you have, you have yes. uh, the, the church as a whole, we read in, in Acts uh, 2, Acts 4, you know how the believers, the followers of Jesus, they come together. And hey, if somebody has a need, I've got something, I'm going to sell it so that I have the means to, to help you meet your need. I mean, this very uh, communal, mm -hmm. supportive thing. But in Acts 5, we read this, this narrative of <clears throat> a man and, a, and his wife who sell a field. And they, they bring the money to the apostles' feet. And, and they're like, like everyone else was like, doing. Like everyone else was doing. Right, in in a sense, like this this act of worship of mm -hmm. of bringing my my finances uh, yeah. to God, but they lied about it. Right, they 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 left a false impression. And again, we and we don't know all <laughs> of the details. But what, what it what it seems to to tell us though is, they said, "Hey, here's all the money we got for the field," but it wasn't all the money they got for the field. Nope. And both Ananias and Sapphira. We're, we're struck dead. Yes, and carried away. And, 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 yes. and I believe it was Peter says, well, what you have, why have you lied to the, to the Holy Spirit? Yes. It's like, that gives me chills right now. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. It's, but it's that heart thing, right? Clearly. Yeah. I mean, there was this, in their case, there was maybe what we would call a posture. Like, hey, they're bringing this forth. Yes. But the heart, mm -hmm. the heart wasn't there. Yeah. And ultimately, it is the heart yeah. that, that Jesus is after. Yep. No. And, and you think about all the ways that we exalt things above God. This just kind of came to me. All, all the things that we do are acts of worship. So when we ascribe worth and we say something is greater than God, death always comes mm. because sin always brings death. And, and here's the example I'll give you. Imagine an individual who uh, doesn't just drink socially or doesn't just drink a little bit, but they drink all day, every day for a good portion of their lives. And as a result of that 
overconsumption of alcohol, they get psoriasis of the liver and they die from that. What they worshiped, what they exalted above God killed them. Mm. Their, their, their object of worship, the idol that they created by their actions destroyed them. And that's, you know, that it can happen And God has given his commands about sexuality. Mm. If you live outside, if I go out in, in the town that I live and I have sex with a hundred different women that aren't my wife and only one of those women has AIDS and I go against what God has commanded me and I commit this sexual act outside of the confines of marriage and I succumb to that disease because of my disobedience, is that not also an act of worship that I've, I've ascribed worth to my desires mm. above what God has said and unfortunately I've reaped it? You know, which again, I think, I think bottom line, like we really have to look at all aspects of life Mm -hmm. and, and where, where we ascribe greater worth to anything over God. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's a, that's a great example. Like our, our desires, but we live in a very me centered culture. I have, and (laughs) I phone, that's right. (laughs) It's I phone, right? Yeah. So yes. the things that we want, and we're and we're encouraged in our culture. To, hey, you got to pursue mm-hmm. the American. You know, you got to yep. get what you want. You got to you know, do all these things. We're very, very me centered. Very, uh, the things that I desire are somehow inherently good, and I I have every right to pursue those things mm-hmm. because. <laughs> and it comes full circle, I think, back to that Garden of Gethsemane moment, mm. where our greatest example in life, Jesus. You know, he didn't want to do it. He, he asked God, is there another way that, this can, that your will can be accomplished? Because if so, let's go that way. But he said, not my will, but your will. And he, he, even unto death, even unto death, he sacrificed and worshiped God mm. um, by giving his own life. So the self-sacrifice and giving up of desires and wants. Let's go there. You ready, Josh? We're going to do this. Ryan did it a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Where, where are mask. we going? Where are we going? Okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I think, think about this. <laughs> think about this. We, we have believers in Jesus who are saying, I refuse to wear a mask because it's my right mm. to, to, not, to choose to not do so. You can't tell me what to do. When, when Jesus says, if anyone would follow me, he must take up his cross, deny himself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, and, and some people will start the science argument and say, well, studies show that it doesn't, doesn't help that much. Who cares if it doesn't help that much? If it helps one person, that is enough. It's enough. So uh, Ryan, is, he had an ad eight. If you, you want to go back and look at that, and he had a message where he, I think God really filled him with a prophetic word for the church today because uh, we need to think not just about the mask, just think self-sacrificially. Mm. Can I give uh, and lay down my own desires and wants for the good of other people? And I think God's calling us to that. Yep. Oh, that's good. That was a tough word he brought. Yeah. I mean, it was tough, but I was like, <laughs> I, I'm like, bring it, brother. And and, it. and and to be to be clear, I mean, yeah. he says this, and, and I think I can speak, I mean, for both of us, neither of us love the masks. No. <laughs> I mean, we're not. <laughs> I do not like it. No. But, and but, I've had a bad attitude about it. I really have. And I've struggled with it. And, and um, you know, thinking about others first uh, has helped me kind of get into alignment with, with that and wear it. I still have my moments, though. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> hey, we're all, we're all on a journey. I do, too. I do, too. <laughs> but, well, hey, um, I forgot to set a timer. For this. Did you get a timer? I didn't get a timer started either. I think we're, we're just, probably. I'm looking at the clock though, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah. wow, I think we've been we've been going for quite a while. We're, we're at least 35 to 40 minutes in, uh, is my guess. Okay, um, <laughs> so maybe we'll wrap this episode up here. Yeah. And uh, but uh, JB, thanks for for chatting. Oh man, this is good. I think we could, we could probably yes, we could probably do at least the whole other episode. But yeah, we've got. Kinsey waiting for us. Kinsey's waiting for us. Not. Yeah. We've always got the, the next so. thing happening here at Radiant Life, but, but it's uh, a joy. Josh, I love uh, talking about the Lord and, and talking about worship, talking about the word. I could do this all day. I love this it. This is good. This love good. it. Well, hey, this has been episode 31 of Radiant Reflections. 
We would love it if you would like, share, subscribe, rate, review. Again, if you're singing, why? Why do I have to do those things? It's an act of worship. It's, oh, but, but not of us. But no. not of us. No. <laughs> it, it is our goal, right, that this, that this podcast is a blessing to you mm-hmm. and helps you uh, dig deeper into what we talk about on a Sunday. Uh, but if, it, if this is something that's a blessing to you, we also hope that it can be a blessing to others other people. Mm-hmm. And so if, if this is something that you share on social media, then they're going to have access and exposure to uh, the things that we're talking about here as well. And JB, I think you said what, every time somebody gives us a five-star review, like... Yeah, it, the, the, the there's a weird the... math algorithm thing that happens with Google, with YouTube, and with uh, Facebook, and especially iTunes. The more people like and share and subscribe, the more seen the podcast and YouTube channel is. It's, it's basically like free marketing. Hmm. So it, it really helps us. So if you believe in what, what God's doing here at Radiant Life, Radiant Reflections, uh, show show that you do by, by sharing, liking, and, and subscribing. Because I know for me, Carrie Newhoff says this all the time, I only listen to the podcasts I subscribe to. Same. Period. Same. If you send me one and I listen to it and it's awesome, I then subscribe and I go back and I listen to all of them. But I only listen to the ones I subscribe to. I generally only watch the YouTube channels that I'm subscribed to. Generally. Yeah. I mean, there'll be random Makes stuff, sense. but I have a list. So subscribe, like, share. I'm with you, Josh. Rock and roll. Well, hey, thanks, you guys, and we will see you next time.